For billions of years, the sun has showered the earth with radiant energy. Every few days, enough solar energy falls on Earth to equal all fossil fuels remaining on the planet. Yet we speak of an energy crisis. In searching for solutions to our energy problems, we are finally beginning to ask the right questions. How much energy do we need? What kinds of energy? For what purposes? My name is Donald Aitken. I am a physicist. Physics is the science of energy use and energy flow in nature, but my particular interest is energy use and energy flow in society. I am the director of the Center for Solar Energy Applications at San Jose State University. No one really doubts that we're in a transition to an age in which our industry and economy will ultimately be powered from renewable solar energy resources. The only question is how far off is that future? A new approach to our energy policy in this country will be to learn to match our energy resources to our energy use. Since the major energy use in the United States is as heat, what we want is an energy resource that delivers heat. And that is what the sun does with today's technology very, very well. Solar radiation is an extremely versatile energy resource. The most direct and inexpensive ways to use it correspond to one of our greatest needs, the heating of homes, buildings, and hot water. Solar heat is provided by technology which is simple, flexible, and accessible to anyone who wants to use it. Much of the impact of solar energy will come from retrofitting solar heating systems onto existing buildings. In early 1978, workers at San Jose State University in California completed work on a solar water heating system for three dormitories. Built largely by students, Project Sun Shower provides all hot water needs on a clear day with a one to two day storage capacity. In New York City, a group called the People's Development Corporation installed a solar hot water system on an old apartment building as part of a community-based renovation program. My name is Claude Burley, and what we have here are collective panels for solar energy and domestic hot water use. We have intentions on doing solar energy in some of our other buildings, which this is one in five buildings that we intend to renovate. What happens is that water is being heated up from the sun's rays and then transferred through the pipes down through here and then is shot into the building. This is called an active solar system because pumps are used to transfer solar heated water from the collector panels to a storage tank in the basement. Incoming cold city water is circulated through a coil in the tank to absorb the solar heat before going to the regular water heater. This preheating saves substantial amounts of energy and in the summer all of the hot water used by residents of the building is solar heated. The principle of all solar hot water heating systems is really the same. The sun strikes a black and metal panel, it heats up the panel, we then run a fluid behind the panel, either in a sandwich form as we have here or in tubes connected to black metal. In any case, the heat of the panel is taken away by the fluid that we flow behind it. This takes advantage of a very important property of solar radiation. Solar radiation is really essentially light radiation. It's short wavelength. So it can go through glass and when it strikes a blackened surface, it is converted to heat by the surface that it strikes. That allows us to take advantage of what we call the greenhouse effect because the heat wants to escape from the blackened surface. It escapes as long wavelength infrared radiation and the glass that lets the solar light through blocks the heat from coming back out. And at the turn of this century, heating hot water for the home with solar water collectors was a very common technique. One third of all of the homes in Pasadena, California in the early 1900s heated their water using solar energy. What's happening that's new now though is taking that technique to do more than just heating water, but using the collected solar heat with much larger systems to heat an entire home or entire building. My name is Mac McPhee. I'm a facilities manager for the Hewlett Packard Corporation. We're standing on a building here in Sunnyvale, California that 
it's 165,000 square feet and it's been equipped with solar heating devices uh, known as solar panels. These panels were constructed in-house by maintenance technicians on off hours. The solar system here is a water system and it's simply connected into the normal boiler loop. When the sun comes out, it just redirects the water from the normal boiler loop up through the solar collectors and back into the normal loop. The total cost of the system was about $30,000 for materials. The payoff period was approximately 18 months to two years. The savings now are approximately $2,000 a month in fuel savings. Once a solar heating system is installed, it is very cheap to operate. Fuel costs are eliminated entirely, and where heating bills are high, large fuel savings can pay for a solar system quickly. San Jose, California is not an area where heating costs are high, but Mac McPhee was also heating a backyard swimming pool, so his home energy use was as high as heating a house in a colder climate. This made it economically practical to install a solar heating system, which he also plugged into his water heater and furnace. I already had a heating system, uh, both for the pool, uh, domestic water, and for the house. But I decided through my calculations that I could probably reduce my heating bills or my gas usage by approximately 80%. The first thing is to reduce your heat loss to as greatly as possible by attic insulation, uh, by storm windows, uh, weather stripping. The second thing you would check is how much sun is falling on your house so that you can determine how many solar collectors you could put up and so forth. The system costs approximately $3,500 and the savings are about $700 a year at present cost. The greatest savings, of course, is realized from the swimming pool because it's the greatest user of energy and heating. I suppose next is the domestic water and then comfort heating. Solar collectors can be located in any sunny spot, either on or near a house. They can also use air instead of water as a medium to transport and collect the solar heat. If you want to heat a home or a building with air, you can run air behind the blackened panel and that too will come out hot. You can put the hot air right into the home or right into the building, or you can put it into storage. In every case, as I've described, using a solar collector, we're running a fluid or air, we're pushing it, we're pumping it, we're using what we call active techniques to extract the heat and put it into storage. That has a middle step of taking the heat away from here, putting into storage, and then bringing into home or building. It would clearly be a more efficient approach if we could skip that middle step and let the solar energy come right straight in to where we like to use it. Let the home or the building be its own collector. Actually, I'm describing an even more ancient technique that's being rediscovered with powerful effect today. A thousand years ago, in the harsh desert climates of the Southwest, the Anasazi and Pueblo Indians built whole communities that were heated and cooled by solar energy. In the northern hemisphere, the tilt of the earth on its axis causes the sun to swing low to the south in the winter sky. By orienting their buildings to face south, the Indians maximized their exposure to the winter sun and used materials such as adobe and stone to capture and store heat. At night, these materials release their heat to warm the dwellings. As the days lengthen into spring and summer, the sun climbs higher in the sky. The Anasazi used cliff overhangs to shade their dwellings from the higher summer sun, for they knew that the best way to cool a building is not to heat it. In temperatures ranging from zero to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the building stayed at 65 degrees the year round regulated only by their ingenious location with respect to the sun. The Anasazi had learned to use their dwellings as solar collectors, and now, a thousand years later, we're learning once again how to design homes and buildings which serve as their own solar collectors. We allow the solar radiation to go directly through windows into the living space where we want it. 
or to shine through glazing against blackened mass surfaces that can absorb the heat and deliver warm solar air into the home. In this case, we use natural convection of air from the warm surface. We don't pump air and we don't pump liquid. We refer this to this as a passive technique. One of the nice elements of it is it works for heating in the winter and for cooling in the summer. The technique in designing passive homes and buildings is to design for solar angles. The sun rises in the winter low in the southeastern sky, stays low in the southern sky at noon, and it sets in the afternoon low in the southwestern sky. So we open up our passive elements to the low-line winter sun in the south. In the summer, the sun swings around to the northeast, stays very high in the middle of the day, and then sets to the northwest, so we can use simple shading devices to keep from overheating the house in the summer. Perhaps more important, I'm standing out here in a California winter day with a temperature in the 40s, and it is overcast. The solar radiation coming through the clouds and going through the windows is heating the house to its temperatures of the comfortable low 70s. The front of the concrete mass wall is 85 degrees and delivering warm air to the house. These are techniques that we've known for a long time, but some very interesting experiments are now being conducted to learn how to integrate these best into new home designs. This is the Sun Dwellings Demonstration Center at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, the purpose of which is to show that passive solar systems work and that they can be simple and easily constructed by owner builders. The first building at the Ghost Ranch uses the principle of direct solar gain. Large south-facing picture windows allow the sun to shine into the building, where it strikes building materials which absorb and store heat, such as concrete floors and thick adobe walls. At night, the heat is trapped in the building by insulation and by heavy curtains drawn over the double-glazed windows. The second passive system is called a trom wall, or thermal storage wall. Here, a south-facing black masonry wall is enclosed by glass. The direct winter sunlight heats up the black wall and the air next to it, and as the warm air rises, it is vented to the living space. The wall itself stores heat for later radiation at night. The third passive design being studied at the Ghost Ranch is an attached solar greenhouse. This solar room collects the sun's heat and passes it to the living space. All three of these passive designs have been highly effective, and the same techniques are being applied to a wide variety of buildings, both old and new. Direct gain is the most common technique of passive solar heat collection. It's important for the sun to directly strike a good heat-absorbing material inside the building. Barrels of water are often used. Stone, adobe, and concrete also have very good heat storage capacities and can be integrated into the construction of the building, as in the case of the thermal storage or trom wall. A variation on the thermal storage wall is the drum wall, developed by Steve Baer. Steel drums are filled with water and directly exposed to the sun. The water in the barrel stores heat and releases it at night. Insulation panels can serve as reflectors during the day and prevent heat loss when raised at night. A modern solar building like this one at Lake Tahoe, California, is carefully tailored to fit its own particular microclimate, taking into account such factors as landscape, prevailing winds, and overall climate. The north side of the building has a small surface area and almost no glass. But the south side has large windows which collect the sun's heat in a greenhouse type room. The warm air rises and is circulated by convection around the inner shell of the house. The main living area is surrounded by a gently moving circle of warm air. The mass of the house itself absorbs heat and keeps the house warm at night and for cloudy periods up to five days. One misconception about solar houses is that they are more expensive than conventional houses. But this passive house was contractor built for about $30 per square foot, which was less than the average local cost for non-solar houses. Passive solar techniques can be applied to any size building in any climate. 
in the high cold climate of Flagstaff, Arizona, freestanding greenhouses have been built which require no additional heat beyond that gained from the sun. Dave McKinnon tells about the greenhouse he helped design and build. This is the solar greenhouse which we built about two years ago. It has a special glazing on the south wall that allows the light to be diffused into the interior. It also keeps a good moisture environment for the plants themselves. During the winter, there's not much light that comes in from the roof and the uh, east and west side walls. So we put insulation on the roof and on the sides to allow the heat that uh, we collect during the day to remain inside. The heat is stored in these uh, large water containers. These are five gallon containers that are stacked one upon the other. The snowstorm on May 1st is not really affecting the interior of the greenhouse very much. The plants are right now about 62 degrees, which is quite comfortable for them. During the day, there's so much energy coming into the greenhouse that it tends to overheat. We've installed vents on the sides of the greenhouse, operated by what is called a heat motor. It consists of a bicycle pump looking device, which contains a liquid that expands when it gets warm. On a snowy day like today, the heat motors will not push the vents open. However, on a clear day, the greenhouse generates enormous amounts of excess heat. In response, the heat motors open and pass this heat to the outside. The Flagstaff Solar Greenhouse is more than just a curiosity. For the first time, such greenhouses are making it possible for Indians and other peoples of the Colorado Plateau to grow their own food the year round. Passive solar heating concepts are easiest to apply to new buildings, but the same principles can be applied to existing buildings, where any south-facing wall can be converted into a solar heat collecting element. Perhaps the best example is the retrofit solar greenhouse. Bill Yanda explains. One of the most attractive things about an attached solar greenhouse is that it can be added on to an existing dwelling quite easily. It can be done at a very low cost. You'd be talking about something in the area of three to four dollars a square foot nowadays. You get not only a very effective solar collector that's adding heat to your home in the winter, you get a year-round vegetable garden, uh, you get additional living space that can be very, very pleasant space for the home. The technology involved in this kind of a thing isn't really very complicated. We teach the building of these uh, attached greenhouses in two-day workshop formats. The people there learn the design principles that go into an attached solar greenhouse and learn that it's not a very difficult thing to do all by themselves. I started building this little greenhouse about two days ago and uh, I've done it most of it by myself. You know, I know a little carpentry, not much. The idea of the greenhouse was uh, to heat my weaving shop. Then I have a lot of green plants inside that I'm sure going to love the temperatures in there, especially during the winter months. I think total cost uh, by the time I'm done will be about $200, which is not a whole lot, considering the savings that I will have with the heating inside the, the shop. We have a lot of sunshine here in New Mexico. It's there for the taking. All we have to do is work a little harder to get the greenhouses or whatever build up against our houses. Solar heating systems, whether active or passive, can often be even more practical in cold climates like Vermont than in sunny, warmer ones like New Mexico. Vermont may have more snow and less sunshine, but the total heating demand is much higher. Over the life cycle of a system, it can easily pay for itself in savings on fuel bills, especially in the colder climate. Bob Holdridge of Heinsburg, Vermont. When we built this, we found out that there was more heat produced in this room because we had minimized the heat loss then the room needed to grow plants. So we vented the excess heat to a kitchen living area directly next to the greenhouse. The greenhouse is small, only 9 by 12, but when the sun is out, we'll heat the kitchen living area. The heat also travels up the stairway into the loft area above, meaning that when the sun is shining in the middle of February, the central heating of the furnace in this house will not go on. This small room will, in fact, 
heat the entire house to a comfortable level of 65 degrees. Even in the coldest and cloudiest areas of the country, solar energy makes sense. Any structure that we start to add to buildings on the south side, from what we know right now, can in fact be energy producers and not energy users. Traditional houses in New England were built to be energy efficient. They were oriented to the sun and had very little exposure to cold northern winds. These design features were integrated into a solar house built by John and Joanne Hayes of Marlboro, Vermont. The house is called a hybrid because it utilizes both active air type collectors and passive solar collection techniques. I guess we got the idea to build this house uh, first probably around the, the time of the uh, oil embargo, was that about 1973. Uh, there was a lot of controversy over whether uh, solar energy would work in Vermont and we knew from our calculations that of course it would, so um, what we did was to build this house to demonstrate to other people that, uh, that solar energy can in fact work. Also we used both passive and active collectors to see which would be better. Yeah, in fact today is a, a very good day for, for uh, looking at the differences between uh, active and, and passive solar collection because if you go into the house you find out that it's probably nearly 70 degrees. Uh, it's being heated just by uh, sunlight coming through the windows. The active solar collectors haven't been on for a couple of days because uh, it's been cloudy. You can't really see where the sun is in the sky right now. It's that overcast, but there's still enough sunlight and energy coming through the clouds to heat the house. The passive solar collection is also much cheaper than, uh, than active type collectors. About 60% of the heat for the Hayes house is supplied by the solar collection systems. The rest is provided by a wood-burning stove. A house this size would require about uh, 1,000 gallons of fuel oil a year, and uh, that translates roughly to, oh, at present oil price is about 500, a little over $500. Um, and the only thing that really costs us is uh, some gasoline for the chainsaw and a little bit of electricity for the solar collector blower. Solar houses have another dimension beyond money saved and resources high. conserved. They tend to be bright, warm, and quiet, leading to a sense of self-sufficiency and integration. It's nice to be able to come out into the greenhouse and on a 20 degree January day and pick radishes and lettuce and have a fresh salad. And although we have a, uh, a freezer for our summer garden, it's not quite the same as having fresh produce. Solar energy has been developed largely by people who have seen that we can't afford to wait for government or corporations or centralized utilities to solve our energy problems. Since solar energy systems are best suited to local, small-scale implementation, individuals and small businesses can play a major part. So far, solar development has occurred with none of the huge subsidies given to fossil fuels or nuclear power. But our hope for the future lies in a transition to renewable forms of energy, and there is much that we can do immediately. We can start by implementing the many solar technologies which are available right now. If all new houses built in the United States in the next 12 years were designed to take advantage of simple, proven techniques of passive solar heat collection, we could save as much energy as we expect to take out of our Alaskan oil fields in that time. And that is only the beginning. Passive retrofit greenhouses and trom walls could be added to many existing buildings in all parts of the country. Tax credits for the installation of solar heating systems are now available from both the federal and state governments. A good portion of the cost of this solar greenhouse kit will be subtracted from its owner's tax bill. The tax credits also apply to active systems, and solar collectors using air or water could be added to almost any building in the United States. As the price of fossil fuels continues to skyrocket, solar equipment is becoming more and more cost-effective. Mass production and local construction of solar systems will continue to lead to lower costs and hundreds of thousands of jobs where they are needed most, like the South Bronx. Ruben Rivera of the People's Development Corporation.
But one alternative that I was thinking about is that if we could produce the collectors here in the community, you know, by stimulating light industry, we might make it more feasible. If we could also, uh, you know, produce and cut and prefabricate the steel here, not only will we create, you know, jobs, but uh, we might make it more feasible in terms of cost. The second phase of our national and world effort must be to develop higher solar technologies for the future. The Sandia power tower uses movable mirrors called heliostats to track the sun and reflect it onto a boiler mounted at the top of a 200-foot tower. The boiler produces steam which drives a turbine to generate electricity. The enormous temperatures produced are high enough to melt steel and can be useful for industrial processes like ceramics. Another exciting prospect is the direct conversion of sunlight to electricity by photovoltaic cells, whose costs are falling dramatically. But we must not waste expensive high-grade energy on purposes which do not require it. Only about 8% of our energy use is for tasks that require electricity, while almost 60% is for purposes which demand heat. These are the kinds of applications for which inexpensive solar technologies are perfectly matched. Solar energy is the only energy resource that's most directly matched to the way we use energy in this country for meeting our primary needs. The more we use that resource, the more we can save fuels and electricity for our automobiles and industry and commerce. A crisis can be a time of both danger and opportunity. Today's energy crisis can really be seen also as today's solar energy opportunity. For me, it gives a direction. You get involved in solar, and all of a sudden, you see an alternative where you can become very career-oriented and very productive and efficient in the normal, ordinary sense, and yet you're contributing positively to uh, social change and to environmental preservation. That's a very, uh, what, liberating kind of feeling to have. Solar is not just a job, it's a movement, you know, it's, it's a whole experience.